The Great Tribulation is a concept in the Bible that has caused a lot of debate, worry, or even excitement. And for many people, it's proof that the end times are not going to be pretty. If you've seen our previous video on post-millennialism and how the Bible gives us hope and optimism for the world, you might be wondering how that could be the case when places like Matthew 24 indicate that the world will descend into utter chaos before Jesus comes back. In fact, most scholars who disagree with postmillennialism do so by appealing to Matthew 24. Well, this problem is answered by a view in theology known as preterism, which just means in the past, because it teaches that the events known as the Great Tribulation happened in 70 AD, when the temple in Jerusalem was destroyed. But does that really fit the description? Let's unpack the tribulation. Before we look at any specific passages, it's really important to take a brief look at the biblical understanding of the temple itself and its significance. In the biblical narrative, the temple isn't just a building. The temple is God's dwelling place among his people. It's the place where heaven and earth meet, just like Jacob's vision of the ladder in Genesis. And this is why in Jeremiah 7, the Israelites presume that because the temple is in Jerusalem, they will be safe from destruction. It's why it's such a big deal when the glory of God leaves the temple in Ezekiel 10, and why in Lamentations the fact that God has allowed his temple to be destroyed gives such a stark realisation of how sinful his people have been. See, the temple is a concept that relates to God dwelling with his people. And so in the New Testament we see that as the Holy Spirit is poured out, which is God's presence, believers are called God's temple. And in Revelation, in the new heavens and earth, we see that there is no physical temple, because God's presence itself is the temple, now that heaven and earth are truly united. But think about this. Because the temple is such a significant part of how God relates to his people, when the first temple is destroyed, it is talked about both prophetically and descriptively in Kings, Nehemiah, Lamentations, Jeremiah, Isaiah, and many more, even though God had promised that the second one would come. In fact, many of these same books talk about the temple being restored as well. But when the second physical temple is destroyed, never to be rebuilt again because now God's people are his temple, would it not leave a big gap in our covenantal history if this were never really talked about? So bearing this in mind, let's turn to Matthew 24. This passage is commonly known as the Olivet Discourse, as it was spoken from the Mount of Olives looking onto the temple. And this is also found in Luke 21 and Mark 13. Now, as already said, this tends to be the key passage for people who view the end times as marked by chaos and calamity. But there are a number of key points in this passage which show that Jesus isn't prophesying about something in our future, but about the temple's destruction that happened 40 years later. So let's get into it. The passage opens with the disciples marvelling at the grandeur of the temple, to which Jesus quite nonchalantly responds that it will all be destroyed. Now considering what we've already looked at about the temple, this surely came as quite a shock to them. The end of the temple means the end of the old covenant ceremonial system, the end of an age. And so they ask him, when is this going to be? So the rest of the text has to be approached with this in our heads, that Jesus is answering the question of when this monumental act of the temple's destruction will be. These verses set the context for the rest of the passage. Next, Jesus lists several world events that will precede the end of the age, wars, famines, and earthquakes. All of these are historically reported in the years between when this prophecy was given and 70 AD when the temple was destroyed. Wars are recorded in Germany, Thrace, Gaul, Britain and Armenia, as well as many conflicts in Israel itself. Many of these battles were against the Parthian Empire, hence Jesus' prophecy that kingdom will rise against kingdom. Famines were in Rome, Greece, Armenia, and Israel. Many earthquakes are recorded in a number of places, 
with major ones in Laodicea, Pompeii, Colossae and Jerusalem. Bearing in mind that this isn't even an exhaustive list, for just a 40 year period this is a large amount of calamity, particularly for those in Israel and even more for the Christians there, as persecution was heightened and false prophets were widespread throughout the land, with too many to name here. But this is only intensified and reaches its full height when Jerusalem is invaded, the temple is destroyed and the city burnt. And Jesus' words that this is a time of tribulation unequaled from the beginning of the world until now is perfectly valid to describe this because he isn't focused on a forensic kind of thinking where greatness of tribulation is equal to body count. Rather, this is about the covenantal significance. Jesus is quoting a phrase which appears throughout covenant history that's used to describe the weightiness of God's judgment. Consider how important both Jerusalem and the temple are to the old covenant economy. Their destruction, regardless of death toll, is more significant than most other historical suffering, including the world wars and even the Holocaust. Because this suffering is directly related to salvific history and a change in the economy of salvation. But to leave us without still wondering if this is more than Jerusalem's destruction being described, Luke qualifies it specifically by applying it to this event. And this is why Jesus then talks about the sun being darkened and the moon not giving its light. He's quoting a combination of Old Testament passages that use signs in the heavens as symbolic of the gloom and darkness that God's judgment brings. And in all of these passages, God uses foreign armies as a means of bringing his judgment, just as he uses Rome to bring judgment on Israel when they invade and destroy Jerusalem in 70 AD. But you may say, you can't spiritualize the text and make it all symbolic. But understanding these signs as symbolic isn't doing any damage to the text, because it's simply reading it in its intended genre. Hyperbole and exaggeration are commonly used in prophecy. We shouldn't consider the prophecy in Isaiah 34 a failed one because the sky wasn't literally rolled up like a scroll. It's intended to give a visually stimulating image to the hearer, not a literal map to what will happen. In Matthew 24, Jesus is using Old Testament symbols to describe God's judgment on Jerusalem. But you might wonder how the coming of the Son of Man happened in 70 AD. Isn't the second coming of Christ still something we're waiting for? Yes, it certainly is, but this verse is not referencing the second coming of Christ at the end of time. This verse is again a combination of Old Testament allusions, to Isaiah 19, but even more clearly to Daniel 7. To understand it in the Olivet Discourse, we really need to see it back in Daniel. In chapter 7, Daniel sees a vision of one like a son of man coming on the clouds before the throne of God to be given all authority, dominion and power. But notice this, the Son of Man coming on the clouds isn't going down to earth, rather he's coming up on the clouds before God's throne. As well as this, Isaiah 19 illustrates God's judgement on Egypt by describing God as riding on the clouds, creating the image of judgement coming from the heavens. And so what we see in Matthew 24 is Jesus acting on the authority and dominion given to him at his ascension to judge Israel for their rejection of their Messiah. So verse 30 isn't talking about seeing Jesus on the clouds in terms of his second coming, but seeing him as he is in the passages that he's alluding to, using his judgment and authority as he brings about Jerusalem's destruction. Finally, Jesus ends this discourse by saying that this generation will not pass away until all these things have taken place. Now this is a very important verse to note. A generation is a time period in scripture of about 40 years, just like the generation that wandered the wilderness. Jesus is making it very plain here that everything he has prophesied will be done within about 40 years and he is shown by history to have been a true and faithful prophet. All these things truly did happen. 
Some theologians try to have Jerusalem's destruction as a partial fulfillment of this passage. But this verse undermines that. Jesus says all these things will happen within 40 years. He's talking only about Jerusalem's destruction. So now if we look back at the passage, we see that the two sandwich ends are Jesus answering the question of when the temple will be destroyed and ends with him saying that it will happen within a generation. All the things he prophesies are rightly applicable to the temple's destruction. And any argument that these descriptions are far too cosmic to just be about Jerusalem's destruction misses how significant and cosmic the temple is in its covenantal context. But with the end of the temple comes the final end of the old covenant ceremony and priesthood. So having had a brief look at the topic of preterism, you can see how putting these passages in their proper context has to alter our view of the end times. And it also means that there is no clash between post-millennialism and passages like the Olivet Discourse, which are about the end of the temple, not the end of the world. But it's important to note, even though many passages like this are focused on the temple's destruction, not the end of the world, the Bible does still teach a second physical coming of Christ at the end of history. Be aware, there is a heresy known as hyper or full preterism, that teaches all biblical prophecy is fulfilled. Don't shortchange yourself by getting caught up in it. And so having looked at Matthew 24, we can see that Jesus gave a prophecy that was fulfilled in the proper time that he said it would be. By bringing his judgment and destruction on them, he's shown his people categorically that we are no longer to make use of sacrifices, the priesthood and the temple, because he is our true sacrifice, our true priest, and our true temple.